Hello, and welcome to another episode. This is episode four of our series on debunked scientific theories. Today, we're learning about recapitulation. Recapitulate, in the grammatical sense, means to repeat something with care. That is, you restate something, but in a cautious manner. Get it? Recapitulation, in the scientific sense, was the idea that, as an embryo develops, it passes through different animal stages. Some believed this reflected man ascending past the lower forms of life. Others thought this represented us transitioning through all of the stages of our evolutionary past. As a human embryo develops, it begins as one cell. And yes, at one point, life was all unicellular. But at one point, mammals, which we are, did not exist. The idea was that we went from a fish stage, then a reptile stage, and perhaps a few more before getting to our final form. This was not just a theory of human development. All animals were thought to go through these stages, and some just went through more stages than others. This Pokemon-style version of development began in the early 1800s, predating Darwin's publication of On the Origin of Species. Of all the debunked scientific theories I've looked into, recapitulation had the shortest heyday. It was never popular in science, as many scientists were having trouble accepting the fact of evolution in the first place, never mind this extra element. The most infamous advocate of recapitulation was Ernst Haeckel, and reverberations from his work can still be seen today in some places if you look hard enough. But eventually, modern observations of how we develop as embryos nullified the idea of recapitulation. Let's get started. Before we begin today's episode, I want to tell you that if you like this content and want to support me, there are links to my Patreon, Venmo, and more in the description on Spotify, or you can go to my YouTube channel and click the link in the banner that says support the channel. You can also check me out on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search Planet Peterson on those platforms. Okay, back to the episode. The origins of recapitulation begin in the early 1800s. The originator of the idea was Johann Friedrich Meckel, a German anatomist born 1781, died 1833. Meckel was a professor of anatomy, pathology, the study of disease, and zoology. He received his doctorate after completing a thesis on abnormal conditions of the heart in 1802. Studying anatomical abnormalities was Meckel's specialty. Today, this is known as teratology. You've perhaps heard the term teratogen before. These are any substances that are known to cause birth defects. Charles Darwin would not publish On the Origin of Species until 1859, but ideas about evolution were around. Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, who died in 1802, was a known supporter of evolution. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who we mentioned in the episode on transmutation, also proposed an evolutionary theory about how organisms change over time in 1802. However, Meckel did not believe in evolution. Meckel was an adherent to the concept of the Great Chain of Being, also discussed in the Transmutation episode. The Great Chain of Being is the concept that there exists natural hierarchies of organisms. Life was viewed as God's creation, and because God has purpose, God must have created objectively better and worse forms of life. Humans were the pinnacle of creation, made in God's image. Other animals were lower, and some were lower than others. The mammal was superior to the bird, was superior to the reptile, was superior to the amphibian, was superior to the fish, was superior to the worm. Plants were the lowest of lows. Before we dive deeper into recapitulation, a crash course in embryonic development will be helpful. A quick caveat, we are discussing development as it relates to mammals only, and more specifically humans, and we are skipping several details, only focusing on what's critical. After conception, we are one cell large. The initial cell is called a zygote, but we are also classified as an embryo. That cell divides until it becomes a solid mass of around 20 to 30 cells called a morula, which then forms a fluid-filled cavity inside of it. The embryo is now considered a blastocyst. What happens from here is the ball of cells indents on itself, eventually making it to the other side. This creates three layers known as germ layers. Each layer is destined to become specific tissues in the body. But at this point, we are nothing but a few hundred or thousand cells that have formed a sort of tube. Because we come from such humble beginnings, we don't look like us. At around five weeks, we look like a gummy worm, complete with ridges on our backs and everything. 
At seven weeks, what is destined to become the head, torso, and limbs can be made out, but we still don't look like us. We have long tails, there are no fingers or toes, and you have a head, but not with what you would consider a face. There's much more development to come. And because of this, if we compared multiple different animal embryos at only the first 15% or so of development, you'd have a hard time identifying them. At the one cell stage, practically all animals are indistinguishable, and the distinguishing features appear gradually. With that in mind, let's continue with Meckel. Being that Meckel studied malformations and birth defects, he had an intimate window into these early critical periods of life. I'm not certain how many human embryos Meckel ever saw, but between chickens and mice, very common living scientific analogs, he easily could have observed countless animal embryos. Gradually, a new idea occurred to him that was influenced by his religious beliefs and studies of zoology and birth defects. What Meckel was convinced of was that as organisms developed, they passed through stages that represent the great chain of being. This didn't necessarily mean that we at one point literally are some other animal in the womb, although we will hear some interesting arguments in favor of that soon. Rather, we merely resemble them. Now, I just told you that we do resemble other life forms during development because there just isn't enough tissue to make us look distinct early on. But recapitulation is different in crucial ways. Recapitulation in this form held to the idea that we resemble the adult version of other primitive animals, much different than saying the embryo of one species resembles the embryo of another. Recapitulation in this form also says nothing about the fact that we resemble embryos of other organisms because of our shared common ancestry, because it rejects that idea. I'll explain more about those connections at the end. Meckel believed that birth defects resulted from errors that occurred during one of these primitive stages. A deformity of the limb didn't produce a malformed human limb so much as it produced a limb resembling a more primitive animal. This seems silly because a deformed human limb will have human skin and muscles and bones, but if I could try to play devil's advocate, perhaps the not so uncommon appearance of webbed hands or feet called Meckel and others to think of a completely different animal such as a fish. Meckel was influential to French physician and embryologist Etienne Serres, who was five years younger than Meckel. The two of them developed what became known as the meckel serres Law. The law states, as mentioned before, that as an embryo develops, it passes through stages that resemble the adult version of lower life forms. Like Meckel, Serres did not believe in evolution. Serres lived until 1868, and so was able to read Charles Darwin's works and fail to be convinced by them. Serres held humans in special regard as the supreme goal of creation. The work of Meckel and Serres influenced a French nationalist, who was about a decade older than them, also named Etienne, Etienne Geoffroy Saint Hilaire. This Etienne accepted the concept of the meckel serres law, but also believed in evolution. More specifically, Saint Hilaire was a believer in Lamarckian evolution. The two of them were colleagues. Once again, these ideas are discussed in more detail in my episode on transmutation, so I'll be brief. According to Lamarck, organisms can acquire new traits through the use and disuse of their organs Experiences that organisms had during their lifetime could change them morphologically and they could pass on those acquired characteristics to their offspring. For example, if a lizard snatched bugs with its tongue and tried every day to stretch its tongue as far as it could, its tongue would grow longer during its lifetime. This lizard would then be able to father or mother lizards with longer tongues than the typical lizard. And that's where the chameleon came from. St. Hilaire agreed but disagreed. St. Hilaire thought the changes that shape the individual occur during the embryo stage. When the animal is an embryo, it's more of a blank slate and easier to manipulate. So exaggerations or deletions or appearances of new traits would occur during development, not during the animal's active life. To try and validate this hypothesis, St. Hilaire experimented with chicken embryos. He attempted to arrest their development at just the right time to stop them from developing their supposed more recently acquired traits. In his mind, this would allow him to hatch fish from the eggs. Even in his time, it was well known that fish were the oldest vertebrates, and so they represented a more primitive, 
less developed organism. Spoiler alert, it did not work. Not everyone agreed with the recapitulationists. German scientist Karl Ernst von Baer, born 1792, died 1876, published a book titled On the Developmental History of Animals in 1828 as a direct rebuttal to Meckel. Von Baer proposed four separate laws of embryonic development. One, general characteristics appear earlier in the embryo than special characteristics. In general, land-dwelling vertebrates have four limbs. The appearance of what we today call limb buds occurs early in embryonic development, but those limb buds look very much the same between species early on. A bat's wing does not resemble a wing until later in development. It does not begin as a tiny, well-distinguished wing that gets bigger over time. The original tissue it forms from looks indistinguishable from the limb bud of pretty much any other mammal. Two, special characteristics develop from general ones. This statement clarifies the previous one. General characteristics form first, then specific ones, but the specific characteristics are just additional changes to the already present general characteristics. Three, embryos diverge and become more different from the beginning. And four, an embryo never resembles the form of other organisms, only the embryo of its own species. These final two are the most direct counterpoints to recapitulation. At one point, yes, different species look similar, but we become more different over time, rather than going through stages where we resemble this species and then that species. Like St. Hilaire, but unlike Meckel and Ceres, von Baer believed that organisms evolve and share common ancestors. But von Baer rejected Darwin's theory of natural selection. Von Baer believed that God intervened and caused life to change over time. The most well-known proponent of recapitulation theory was Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel was a German zoologist who dabbled in many other fields. Haeckel was born in 1834 and so absorbed the ideas of Meckel, Ceres, and St. Hilaire, using them to shape his scientific ideas until his death in 1919. Haeckel coined the phrase Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Ontogeny means the development of an embryo, and phylogeny refers to the ancestors on your branch in the tree of life. Haeckel believed in Darwinian evolution, but he thought you could see the evolutionary history of a species unfold during embryonic development. This distinguished Haeckel from others, but he still maintained that we go through the adult stages of more primitive animals during our development just as they did. Hackel was an excellent artist and used his talent to recreate his observations and publish them for the world to see. The problem was that his drawings were not true to form. Hackel believed his theory, so you can't call him a liar, but he made his drawings in a way to make the viewer see what his theory states. This is biased, and it removes the depersonalized objectivity that science is supposed to adhere to. Hackel's drawings are still common to see, and well-meaning people present them as evidence of evolution. You will even see them in high school textbooks, but with the caveat that the drawings are considered not true to life. In the modern age, evolutionary developmental biology, often called evo-devo, does adhere strongly to embryonic development to explain evolution, but it rejects recapitulation entirely in favor of von Baer's laws instead. What about Charles Darwin? We've referenced people's beliefs about his theory, but we've never discussed his thoughts on recapitulation. To be brief, he didn't buy it. Darwin believed a common ancestor would likely have an embryo that looks similar to the modern-day species, but this doesn't necessarily mean we go through a stage resembling our ancestors. Remember, recapitulation asserts that the embryo looks like a fully formed adult version of other species, not the embryo of another species. Additionally, the idea did not fit with the principles of natural selection. Embryos are subjected to far less selective pressure than adults because they are not really part of the environment. Therefore, it is reasonable to expect that embryos of different species share similarities, but they diverge over time as they develop the traits they inherit that help them survive in particular environments. In the end, the only thing recapitulation theory got somewhat correct was that embryos of other species do somewhat resemble other embryos very early on. This is because all life begins at the one cell stage, 
And so the specific differences have to emerge gradually out of a sort of amorphous embryo. Because all mammals have heads and limbs and bodies, we're going to look similar before our specific traits appear. There are also modifications to special embryonic tissues that are legacies of our ancient ancestors. Darwin didn't use the word evolution. He called it descent with modification. Evolution cannot create brand new structures out of whole cloth. It can only modify pre-existing structures. For example, early on in embryonic development, we have what are called gill arches. These are a series of ridges on the ventral superior portion of the embryo where you can imagine its face will eventually form. They're called gill arches because if you map these areas out in fish and watch where each patch of tissue ends up, they form the gills and part of the jaw. However, in mammals, these gill arches develop uniquely to form, among other things, our larynx, lower jaw, and inner ear bones. This coincides beautifully with von Baer's embryonic laws that state general characteristics form first, then specific characteristics form from those general ones. Thanks for listening. Thank you.